So what sort of non-rigid deformations we want to handle? Right? As I said, just saying uh, some transformation is non-rigid is not enough, right? You would want to uh, to be more specific, otherwise it's just untractable, right? So Vignesh is expansion, contraction, twisting. So again, so okay. Maybe my example that I gave you she was misleading. Forget the stretching. It's okay. Maybe let's just look at the tail portion. What's happening to it? There's no stretching, right? I mean, let's ignore stretching even if there is. But it's still non-rigid. So, okay, let me give you another example. Let's say uh, Sumuk had a lot of these humanoid like meshes, right, in different poses. Right? So in a particular pose, he was just standing normally in a different pose. The humanoid mesh was like both his hands were raised, etc., etc. There also the shape is the same, isn't it? But again, that's a non-rigid deformation. So what? So think of these objects. So forget. Uh, we are just trying to model the surface of the mesh. Okay. Let's assume we are working with surface meshes. The surface meshes, of course, are a discretization of the surface, isn't it? So as far as the surface is concerned, what property of the surface is still remaining the same? That's the question. So if you want, you can think of this cat example. If you want, you can think of those humanoid mesh examples that Sumuk gave you yesterday. Uh, in any of these cases, as far as the surface is concerned, what is the property that's not changing? Area, uh, according to Vignesh, something even more fundamental. So let's consider uh, the humanoid meshes or this cat mesh. If I take two points, let's say one on the tip of the ear and uh, the other on the other tip of the ear. Okay, so you have two tips. Maybe I can mark them. This is one point, this is one point, and these are the corresponding points on the second surface. What is not changing? So these are anatomical landmarks. Yes, I chose these two just so that I could mark them here. But for any two points that you pick, roughly what is not changing? Again, roughly. So, okay, let me give you a, a hint. Just ignore the stretching for now. But not the bending. Okay, I mean, please be careful. Stretching and bending are two different things. I'm saying ignore the stretching. Even if there is stretching, there is it is very local, localized to some regions, and even for those regions, let's say we can ignore them. Then What about the distance between points? And by distance between points, what distance am I talking of? No, not procrastus. Procrastus is a shape based distance here. Let's say this point is V1, this point is V2. Two corresponding points here are W1 and I think it's here W2. What is the distance between V1 and V2 and W1 and W2? So if I take 
this euclidean distance between v1 and v2 and the euclidean distance between w1 and w2 is it changing it is right i mean it's of course changing but what about the surface distance that i'm calling bg in v1 and v2 and the surface distance so if this is c1 so surface distance on c1 surface distance on c2 between w1 and w2 approximately what can we say about this so by distance on the surface i hope it makes sense so it's like uh, take the example of earth and take the two points as north pole and south pole if i ask you what is the difference uh, what is the distance between north pole and south pole of course you would give me the length of the longitude agree tougher to evaluate i am only looking at it at the conceptual level the distance between north pole and south pole you won't of course give me the distance along the axis right because it just doesn't make any sense of course it is still a distance usually you would give the distance that one would be able to travel on the surface of the earth and so similarly here this geodesic distance is the shortest distance between the two points restricted to the surface okay so as far as there is no stretching so which is why i had been in sort of repeating and hammering the same thing again and again let's ignore the stretching as far as there is no stretching and you can sort of roughly see yes i'm not saying there is no stretching at all but it is sort of not too much because of course there is a little bit stretching near the hind legs and uh, yeah i think that's about it apart from that there is no stretching right so approximately at least we should be able to say that these two geodesic distances are the same and of course there is nothing specific about the two points that i am picking for any two pair of points that you pick maybe here and here and the corresponding point would be here and here right the geodesic distances between the two pairs of points should be approximately the same yes so this non rigid transformation that you want to characterize are transformations that do not affect the metric so metric is just a, a more mathematical term for distance so by distance i am again uh, although it's not explicitly mentioned but since i'm looking only at the surface and i'm not worried about whether the surface is put in or it is sort of contained in r3 in this way or this way right as far as the metric is concerned these two are one and the same so i want to make a cost function which is invariant not only to rigid transformations remember rigid transformations also do not affect the distance right that is something that i think we wrote down on the first slide some very yeah it's here right does not alter distance the converse question is larger isn't it in the sense that yes rigid transformations are transformations that do not alter distances but are all transformations that do not alter the distance rigid transformations anyone can you give me a simple example of a transformation that does not alter the distance 
but is still not rigid. I hope I have not lost more people along the way. Trying to avoid math as far as available, as far as possible. Sort of postponing the math to the end so that I can hurriedly rush over it. Squeezing clothes, twisting. Simple example. Clothes, well, it depends on uh, what the cloth is made of, right? I mean, if the cloth is even slightly elastic, if you, of course, you're able to stretch it, that means distance is changed, right? Okay, let me give you a simple example. And please, since my uh, camera is on, I can sort of demonstrate. What is this? Piece of paper, right? What am I doing here? Just rolling it, bending it, right? Are the distances being affected? No. Okay, so this, and is this a rigid transformation? No. Okay, so so simple example of a non-rigid transformation that still preserves the distances. Of course, if I take, let's say, yeah, this elastic thread on the end of my mask, stretch it, pull it out, it's a non-rigid transformation, right? But also the distances are not preserved. Okay? Another example, what if I, I hope this is not important, it's not, take this, what did I do? Rigid or non-rigid transformation? Non-rigid. And are the distances preserved? No, right? Because there is no way a point, there is no path basically uh, between a point on this side of this paper and this side of the paper. Okay, so I hope you find this interesting. You can play around with this uh, for a long time. It's not the same shape. Yes, exactly. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not the same shape, even if the distances are preserved. Right, I mean, oh, I told this off I can take another paper. So this is a plain sheet of paper. I curl it up. Yes, distances are not changing, but as far as our intuitive understanding of shape is concerned, the shape has changed. Right? Agree, all of you? Right. So, the thing is, even though it does not necessarily preserve the shape, but in practice, right, if you look at this example or the humanoid example, right, this is a characteristic of the transformations that we want to deal with. We want to be able to propose a cost function which are invariant to transformations that do not affect the metric. That fine. I'm not saying that all transformations that do not affect the metric also preserve the shape. Okay. okay. So, transformations right, that we have just defined, that is those transformations which leave distances between all pairs of points unchanged are what are called isometric deformation. The word 
should be uh, yes iso i got that several times the same metric right, that's exactly the word i used metric means distance the points before applying the transformation and after applying the transformation still have the same distances so the distance is preserved all right in i hope and pray that all of you are following discussion it's still no map but i don't think i'll be able to keep it uh, for more longer right so far the discussion is intuitive right so the idea is this right i think it's a brilliant idea let me disclose the idea so let's say you are given a surface x okay and you have some tool i mean as vignesh pointed out how do we measure geodesic distance uh there are several algorithms to do that let's not worry about that as of now so but we are going to introduce notations dx okay instead of dg i'm using dx to denote the geodesic distance on this surface x dm on the other hand maybe i should have used a different notation i'm not sure but dm denotes the euclidean distance in some rm okay it clear with the notation dx whenever i use dx it will mean geodesic distance on the surface x dm would mean the straight line distance in some m dimensional real vector space okay now let's just say by magic there is this function f available to us okay what is so special about this function is f so as to used with the word magic let me describe that so f is a function that maps points on this surface x to some m dimensional space okay m dimensional euclidean space all right such that what should happen is geodesic distances between the points x i and x j should now transform into the straight line distances between fx i and fx j and this should happen for all pair of points on the surface can you guys can take about 30 seconds understanding what this equation means and uh, if it's clear to me please let me know either speak out or just Right. We will repeat this once more. There is some function f that maps these points on the surface X to R M. If okay, M, what is M? That's not an issue. Let's say M is anything. I mean, ten, twelve, hundred. It doesn't matter as far as it is finite. Plus. what is so good about f is and why is it good i will tell you to all geodesic distances on the surface right are now transformed into straight line distances between fx i and fx j so it's basically uh, to give you a simple analogy let's say i have a piece of thread that i am holding it this way right so this is my sort of surface x right this function f what it does it it basically pulls it out straightens it this is x1 x2 this point is f of x1 this point is f of x2 uh i think 
I'm not very sure I understand Ignatius comment on Sachi's comment over this. Number of points between two corresponding points. What does that mean? So what do you mean by between two points on a surface? It's not necessary that both the meshes have the same number of points and therefore, first, first of all, I mean, if you make it clear to me, what do you mean by point between two points? It's, it's a surface. Uh, right? Sir, actually at that time we were comparing those uh, two shapes of the cat image that we had. Uh -huh. So uh, when you asked if, um, if there is anything that will remain same, uh, between two points. Oh, okay. So at that point, I replied that the number of points between uh, those two points will remain same. No, but again, so what do you mean by points between two points? So are you saying that it's like uh, points that I would have to travel through in yes, order sir, to go like from one point? Yes, okay. sir, like the geodesic distance. Right, but again, as I said, the number of points in both the meshes may not be the same and therefore we cannot expect that the number of points between any two points would also be the same. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh, right. So now, okay, uh, have all of you understood this, what this function is doing? Yes, sir. Okay. So, again, for now, let's assume, okay, it's a very big assumption that such a map exists, okay, given instead of the surface so that we can sort of look at the implementation issues, let's talk of a point cloud. Okay, and assume there is some uh, oracle that is going to give you geodesic distances between any two points of this point cloud. Uh, so now let us denote these mapped points fxi by zi and the entire collection by zx. Okay. Similarly, let us assume that this function f, whether it's the same function or if there is a different function, doesn't really matter. But let's say there is a function that also does the same thing on the point cloud y. Okay, so then f, f y i, you can collect it as a set in Rn, and let's call this set as z y. Okay, so now the main question here is this. What do you think is the relation between Zx and Zy? And of course, maybe I didn't point out here, but hopefully you've read the first bullet point. These X and Ys are point clouds coming from surfaces. You, if you are having issues thinking of them as point clouds, think of them as surfaces. They are given to be intrinsically same. By intrinsically same, I mean the both these surfaces are related by an isometric deformation. So, by the way, I don't I don't think it has come up in any of the previous session. But when I say intrinsic property of a surface, it means that it doesn't matter how the surface is contained in R three at which position, which orientation, etc. it is contained in R3, it does not matter. Whenever I talk of an intrinsic characteristic of a surface. Similarly, not just the pose and orientation, but think of it as you were an ant living on that surface. Right? So you're completely unaware of the surrounding space. In that case, the only thing that would matter to you is the distances. Okay, so as far as distances are the same on any surfaces, they are intrinsically said to be the same. Okay, so this example that I showed, 
plain paper and if i roll it up almost like a cylinder these two surfaces although their shapes are different but intrinsically they are the same okay so now the question is given that x and y are given to be intrinsically same how are zx and zy related so for example in this case right this thread which was like this i have pulled it out via this mapping f to obtain a straight thread instead of starting with such a thread i could also start with the same thread but in this configuration let's call this as y right i can sort of use similar function to f let's call it g and sort of pull it out in a vertical direction this would be gx1 gx2 what is the relation between this and this <coughs> even so at least in this example i hope you can see great sachi good job i think uh, that was the answer i was looking for zx and zy the only way that they can be different can be via a rigid transformation of each other do you see that maybe sachi you can explain why did you come to this conclusion uh so mainly because uh, this diagram help that you uh, okay. drew and also right. because we have uh, i think taken out all the non rigid transformations and brought them to uh, a simpler version where uh, i mean both f and uh, g here are uh, either translationally or rotationally different otherwise they are like right. almost similar exactly see all the geodesic distances that were there on the surface are now straight line distances right and i already told you that x and y there is in they are intrinsically the same so distances are the same on both the surfaces all of them have been straightened out in some sense right in the sense of as i have demonstrated in this example pull things apart so that whatever were distances geodesic distances are now straight line distances therefore the only difference that can happen in zx and zy is via a rigid transformation all other transformations have been eliminated right so now so you can see that if i have such a function f that does this it basically my problem is solved isn't it can you see why again i have not guaranteed an existence of such a function f but let's assume such a function f exists then my claim is that the problem is solved why is now what is the remaining problem so i have zx zy exactly now we are left only with rigid transformations how do we solve rigid alignment assuming icp works you can use icp right so we are done so problem solved course once again the foundation of my claim was existence of such an f 
So does such an app exist? Right? Uh, now what is sort of the most important question left is this question. Does such an app exist? What do you expect? Again, intuitively, mathematically, I will argue soon, but intuitively, so think of any closed surface. Let's take a sphere. Right? What are the geodesic distances on a sphere? They are the arc lengths of the great circle joining the two points, right? And you want to straighten out these arcs into a line segment. Right? That is what F does. If you were to straighten it out for two points, it could be done. But you want to straighten it out for all pair of points. Would that be possible? Right? Intuitively, what do you think? This is a sphere. Right, so it's like this point, this point, the geodesic distance would be the length of this arc. You would want to straighten it out like this. But not just this, you also want to do the same here in the same space. So we want a function, right? I mean, remember, I'm saying I want a function f from the surface x to rn that does this. I cannot say that this point maps to this also, this also, and so on and so forth. See, as far as, let's say you had this, again, this example of point. If it was something like this, I could do that, right? I could just open it out. But now if I have a closed cylinder, if I close it out, so think of the, identify both these edges with each other. How do I open this out? If I cut out this cylinder, then do you think the distances property will be preserved? No. Right? Because there is very little distance between this point here and this point here. If I cut it out between these two points, the straight line distance is going to be much more. Okay, so the idea is Uh, so it doesn't seem intuitively to be possible. That's all I want to convey here. Let me now take, now this finish is here. Let me something like that. Not exactly. Let me now take an example. Forget all pair of points. Let's just take four points. Let's call them x1, x2, x3, and x4. So now I want to ask you a simple geometry question. What should be the radius of this sphere so that the distance between the geodesic distance between x1 and x3 is 1? Who will answer that quick, quickly? What should be the radius of this sphere so that this distance between x1 and x3 is 1? Circumference is 2 pi r. This is? OK, thank you. 2 by pi. Good. So, what is dx1x3? That's as we just 
you get is one. Maybe I'll make a table. One, X two, X three, X four. And fill in the table. I want the geodesic distances. But I do the easy part first. X one and X three we figured out is one. So X three, X one is one. How about X one, X two? That's also one. This is one. X one, X four. It's two. X two, X three. That's one. X two, X three is one. X two, X four is one. I hope I'm not making any mistake. X three, X four is again one. Okay. Now let's denote these. Let's say there is some function f, f that we are looking for, and we denote f x i by z i. Okay. What should be the distance? So distance now in the z space in the R M space is the straight line distance, right? So z one minus z four. What should that be? Quick. What should be z one z four? Z one minus z four norm. So this is distance between z one and z four. If f satisfies that property, then should be two. How about z one minus z three? Basically, I'm asking you to read it out from the table. One, z three minus z four. Again, one. So, what does that tell us about z three? Triangle inequality. Sure, you have all studied this. Sum of lengths of two sides of a triangle, right? So z1, z3, z4, they form a triangle. Sum of lengths of two sides must be greater than equal to the length of the third side. So z1, z4 is the third side two. This is one plus one, so this is fine. But what does that tell us about z3? It tells us that it's the midpoint, as Omkar has pointed out. Point of z1. And Z4. Similarly, what is Z1 minus Z2? Distance. That's again one. And Z2 minus Z4. Again one. What does that tell us about Z2? Obviously, z2 is also the midpoint of z1 and z4. So, can we have two distinct midpoints of one line segment? No. So that means z2 and z3 coincide. If they coincide, what is the distance between z2 and z3? Zero. So see that. But what do we want? We want z two and z three to be at a unit distance away from each other. So what have we proved? Basically, it's a proof, right? Proof by counter example. We prove that. Remember and see the simplicity of this example, right? All I'm asking you to do is just map four points. Forget all other points. 
and the other thing is i did not put any limit on how high this m could be no matter how high dimensional space you take this proof remains valid so basically we have shown that such an f cannot exist irrespective of what rm you pick at least for this example so in general of course we cannot say that such an f exists this example is named after the person who gave it lineal so this is called lineal example okay again this was a mathematical proof but i hope you were able to follow it right just high school geometry involved in this right so what do we do such an f does not exist all our hopes were pinned on the existence of f which have now collapsed 